Hello, Russell. How are you, mate? I'm fine, Andy. Nice to speak to you after quite a long while. Yes, it's the trouble with, it's the trouble with COVID and the music business is that you 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 have a friend and then you never see them, do you? You know, it's like your circles are crossing and then they don't. Uh, Russell, I think you're one of the finest drummers to ever come out of the UK. Um, That's very fond of you. <laughs> you've got you've got two of the best hands I've ever seen in my life. I you're the best part. Hands. <laughs> I work bloody hard at them like I you know did. you have, mate. You've like been in the industry did. for a long time. Yeah. I don't want to go through all the people you've played with. It's it's a list yeah. as long as your arm. You're mm. now currently playing in one of the most historic, um, legendary rock bands of all time, Uriah Heep, one of one of the founding fathers of heavy heavy rock and heavy metal. Mm. Um, and I'd love to get into that. But you put a thing on Facebook the other day, and I'm going to read out a quote from you now. Yeah. You said this. I devoted myself to music my whole life and to see how it's destroying itself is so sad. And uh, we've known each other for a while, Russ, and I I, I uh, thought I've got to get you on and have a chat about this, you know, because mm -hmm. um, it's very contentious. Some people say the industry is going one way and, you you know, we're all sort of dinosaurs with our guitars and drums and rock music. And then there's the other opinion that that was a golden age of music and, and actually there's things like gatekeepers and other things that are going on, which are making it difficult for us. So what, what um, motivated you to make that comment? Well, it's just a fact of reality. You know, I, I tour 64 countries and being in a touring band, doing festivals, meeting up with some of my mates in world-class bands all the time. And what you're noticing, or, you know, it's been going on for many years, like some people have commented on there, and it wasn't uh, right. Like, this is my time to say it. It was just a case of well, it was my time to say it. And um, the fact of the matter is, things like X Factor and Britain's Got Talent, which should, and never has had the X Factor, and never had Britain's Got Talent, as far as I'm concerned. You know, they they they've quashed the world of music into this one little avenue of all about the singer singing karaoke basically to um famous songs and not that that's right i think there's a place for every kind of musical situation for anyone to get into because the music business is so vast i get that but the record companies and technology is completely annihilating it music was the special artistic expression and creation of musicians now radio stations want to edit your song down to three and a half minutes because they've got a schedule to keep. Well, hang on a minute. Without us, you wouldn't even have a radio station, number one. Well, you'd have nothing to play. So they're already starting to, they decide, to chop your expressive creation because <laughs> they can. Then the computer comes in. Oh, yeah, I can see you're out of time. But, no, hang on a minute. You can what? I can see you're out of time. No, music is about listening. So if you can feel it and hear it, right, and it sounds great, leave it, let it be. Because if you now may, may move everything into what's considered perfect time, it now sounds wrong, in my opinion. It's, you've just taken away the magic and the soul. And that's why people will always go back to the 50s, 60s and 70s if we talk about rock and roll. Oh, have you heard that from Zeppelin? Have you heard that with the uh, um, Marvin Gaye? And did you hear this? And did you? you know, hang on a minute. That was the magic. You let the players play. You let the artists perform. The verses were what they were, whether it was eight minutes or two minutes. They had a story to tell or whatever it was that they wanted to put across. And people accepted it because that was the new beginning of rock and roll, the new beginning of music. And now they want to interfere again. And they've interfered. And as I said, as, as wonderful as technology is, it's completely annihilating the beauty of why musicians did what they did. And I can't stand it. And I've had people say, well, you should, you know, you've got to embrace it. Yes, to a certain degree, of course, you have to embrace it. You can't live in the dark ages. We all know that. But not at the expense of what. I mean, I worked my ass off like you did. I don't know whether Andrew's a player or not, but you work your ass off to develop the way of playing that is magical 
to the musical project you're doing and someone annihilates it. Oh, don't we have to do another take? I'll just put this together there. What? Well, what about the transition? You can be, no one cares anymore. And so what happens is the educational part of the music business, why you bought the album, why you opened it, why you're listening to the, um, the, the actual album, reading the contents, reading the lyrics, how it was put together. It was designed by so-and-so and then the producer did. That was a wonderful experience. And that experience, if it had been kept educating the new generations, they wouldn't know any different. They'd still be doing it. But the music business itself allowed that education to be wiped out. They allowed the streaming to come in, so we'll just nick your music for nothing. Thank you very much. Um, annihilate the, the work of incredible uh, artists. And we, it's gone so far down the line now that it, we're literally hanging on, I feel, we're hanging on on the last threads. I know that, you know, it's the first time in 20 years download was sold, sold out, right? There's still a market for people who love the thing about live music because it's it's real but that's just a small percentage of the business you know and, and unless you've got these amazing artists and they've all they're all capable of doing it if the massive artists all turned around and went to the record companies oi sort your shit out mate right we're not having this this is our uh life we de we dedicate our flaming lives to the career it's not a little in and out job um but no one says anything, so it just carries on the way it does. And then you, you're forced to accept it. When I do recordings now, I have to do it. Yeah, I'm doing it with him. We do it old school. We try and put the rhythm tracks down. But it's still a lot of magic lost because the producer is saying it's got to be done a certain way. Well, I might as well do, well, just, I don't know. You know, I'll just do I, a table. I, was, I think you've hit the nail on the head because I thought, I wonder what he's going to say straight away. All these things are going on. But what you've just identified is what I think is the problem. Interfering. Yeah. Interfering from people who aren't musicians, record companies, producers, A&R, label owners, venues, all interfering. And the thing I don't understand is sometimes someone will say, have a listen to this song, like a pop song in the chart, and have a listen to it. I'm, I'm not a fan of it, but I think they can sing. It's not a bad song, right? It's not a bad song there, right? Yeah. Uh, do you want to? Are you muted, Andrew? Because you're, you're, you're your face. I don't, I don't think I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. If, if you want to chime awesome. in, Andrew, any time, just chime. But um, it's the interference from outside. Like, like as the music industry has developed, they've had to grab back control. Yeah. What I don't understand is I, I listen to them in these pop songs, and I think if you put a real band behind that of really good players, it wouldn't be a bad little song. Well, they no. walk into the studio, they put it down in an afternoon. Well, that's if it's real instruments. Most yeah, of the, the real instruments, it's like, why have they swapped a technology? That The old technology, where a band goes in a room, they jam something out, they get a vibe and a feeling, they drop that's that good. vibe on a record, done. Don't it hasn't got to be. It hasn't got to be perfectly everything played together. That's the magic that they completely annihilated. And the thing on the rock bands is the other thing that the technology's done is they've taken away individuality. You could hear the way Ian Pace plays. You could hear the way Jimmy Page plays a guitar, right? But now all the guitars are processed. They all sound the same. It could be any guitarist. It could be any drummer. So they completely wiped out the thing that you tried to nurture that made you special was an individual musician. That there were there were always guys like session guys could play anything, and a lot of us, you know, muso drummers, we always love those guys. But as I've got older, I've realised there's a whole set of drummers like Ian Pace, Keith Moon, Bev Bevan, John Bonham, Stuart Copeland. They sold the record because when they oh. played. That the the basic vibe of the record came from the drummer. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with Bev Bevan, and uh, you know, I played alongside him uh, so many times. I, I got more chops than him, mm. but I can't play a groove yeah. like him. When he plays a groove, it sounds like a hit record. Right. You know, it's like, and this is what everyone's forgotten. So let, let's break this down into the bits. You know, can you explain to the audience what's actually going on when a drummer now goes into a modern recording studio? What's actually happening to those drums? Yeah, well, what t tends to happen is, I mean, luckily for us, the last producer we had, Jay Rustin, is really, really good. He is a bit more old school. So when I picked him up from the airport, I was the one that picked him up from the airport, we drove all the way up to uh, Lincolnshire to Chapel. Fantastic recording studio, Chapel, right? They, my drums are set up in the old converted Chapel, and the sound is just, well, it's to die for, you know. 
as it as it would be. And I'm up with him, and I said, "Look, you know, I've got I've got the skins of my choice." I said, "However, I've got the tape, I've got the moon gel, I've got a bit of foam, I've got some towels, I've got three different rides." I said, "I've got three different chinas, three different i hats. I've got about eight uh, different kinds of crashes." Right? He said, "Have you finished?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "I'm not interested in any of that," and it was fantastic. He said, I can't tell anything until I get in the room and you play how you play, and then that will determine what goes on. I thought, because well, before this, I've had producers telling me, no, I want this, I want this, I want that, what, without even hearing anything. And that tells me that you've already got this drum sound here. Well, what is that all about? Who are you to tell me my drum sound? It's disgusting. Uh, what tends to happen on the on the on the, old, the old school then? Let's not go to to Jay because he's a bit different. He's he's cool, but you go in there, uh, front head off the bass drum. What? We need the front of off the bass drum. What without him? <laughs> True. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the air can't respond off the skin, right? To give that nice all the bottom all the low, low frequencies are gone straight away. I said, and the length of quarter note. In a rock band, I'm talking about length, not talking about pop, pop or anything like that, where you might need it, you know, a little bit more muted, a little bit more dampening. In a rock setting, you want the front head off, and then you want a pillow put in there. So it's now turned into a cardboard box. And then you put a towel or you put this thing on it to, to make it a, a, a tunnel. So you've taken off the the nice bit of air and bottom end and you put a tunnel on to try and get it back because you didn't want the the, the resident head on uh how the hell does that work you know and then the technicality you know wizardry of what they read on page 57 um comes out to you i'm not interested in that mate i'm interested in the sound that's all i'm interested in i play i produce a sound you capture the sound record it and bob's your uncle right so not only does that get done, or you can't play uh, big cymbals in a studio, no. What are you talking about? Oh, no, no, no. See, the sound, when it goes down, they give it all the mics, and it, the, the, you, you have to play smaller cymbals. Can't hit them as hard. As ever. No, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. So you've gone to, obviously, a school that knows shit about drums, right? I spent a lifetime, I went to bed with a 16-inch crash cymbal, mate, and you're turning around and telling me, right, what I, how I should be playing. You are supposed to be recording me as a drummer, irrelevant of how I sound in a, in a way. Well, with a session, it's different, right? But as a member of your right heap or whatever it is. So you want me now to change the way my emotion plays if I get into a crash in, but I really want to really, I'm, I'm not allowed to do that because I might upset the microphone that's hovering over my 12-inch tom-tom. No, mate, sorry. Right? If, it's for you to deal with. That's why drums are such a beautiful instrument, like a piano. The harmonics that go between the whole kit, splashes, crashes, rides, tom-toms, bass drums, etc. They're there, they work with each other. If you're a great drummer, you tune up the drums, it works like a grand piano. You wouldn't go around the notes, oh, that, that top D there is just interfering with that uh, F sharp. So we just put a little bit of dampening on there so it doesn't give it a little bit of an over. You don't do that. Leave the flaming instrument. Leave it, right? If the drummer can't play, can't tune, right? It's a, you have to look at it differently. But don't disrespect someone who's been playing ages. And you wouldn't have got, you see, John Bonham's drum sound. Is John Bonham's drum sound? Everyone raves about it. Yes, let him have Billy Cobham at his drum sound. You know what I mean? That's the only way to, for me, to have the identity and to also allow drums to breathe instead of someone that thinks they know everything telling you how to play, telling you how to um, muffle, muffle your drums. So I've got to play not like myself, so why am I here? And I've got to have a drum sound that doesn't sound like me. What am I doing here? I hate you're, it. You're, you are just expressing how I feel. I mean, I, I sort of got out of recording and, and then I've sort of come back into it, but I just, got, I just got fed up with it because I'd go in there, learn the stuff, go down there, play it, tune the drums and all that. And then when I got the record back, I was like, where, where, where am I? I know, where are I'm you? I'm on albums where I got a credit and I don't know what track I'm on because I can't hear myself on the album. Be and I'll tell you why they do this, right? It's because nowadays producers want to lock you to the grid. 
They want to be able to trigger if they need to off each drum. So they want it all separate and they want to be able to lock you in time to the grid. So that means you've got to play to a click and you've got to play um, your parts on your own. And this is my big thing is, is that what we've really lost is a band in the room playing at the same time. Magic, the magic. And if a band's rehearsed and they've got it down and the track's five minutes long, in a studio which is designed to record everyone at the same time, that's why they cost like a million quid, right? And then they're not a bedroom, right? If you go to a, a studio and set a band up, that song, if it's five minutes long, will be done in five minutes. Mm, it's know. bonkers. And I think people have forgotten about this. They've forgotten about what musicians do. And it's because these producers have got c- control now. This is, you know, it's, not, it's the producer that makes the track now. They've got to justify their existence, mate. Exactly. You get paid for a job. I've got to justify it somehow. So I can do technical jargon, which I know you don't know 100% about. Right? And if you do, they get caught out. Or they can use it in a way that makes you feel guilty because it's got to be done and that's it. Yeah. And I, I remember saying, well, hang on a minute, where's the push and pull? What are you talking about? I said, sometimes the music, if it's played in time, can sound like it's dragging. The nature of the song needs it. It needs to push. I need to be moving in front of that click. I said, I can't move in front of a click if the other musicians are not playing with me, can I? I said, who are they going to play to? I said, if I want to sit on it in the verses, I want to just put it back a bit. I said, you're, you're going to see that as slowing down on your grid and put me in time. And now you've completely changed the whole feel of the song. A song's supposed to move like a roller coaster. Tension and release. Tension and release does this. And when it's tension and release, you're sitting and you're pushing. All the greatest uh, music I've ever heard isn't in time. It doesn't need to be. It sounds beautiful. So why is it then, if you look at Spotify and you look at what people are listening to, I think it's something like 8% is modern music, new new music. The reason why Spotify works is because everyone's going back to listen to stuff from the past. That's the biggest thing. Queen, you know, all those bands are huge. And Mm. so if that's the case, why isn't the industry cottoning on to the money that's been made? Because I think everyone goes on about the internet and downloading and stuff like that. I also think it's the fact that people have forgotten how to put records out that people really like. They only quite like them now because they're designed to be on a ringtone or like a TikTok, you know, four bars of a drum loop. People have forgotten. And and I'm sure if the record companies would go, what, we're going to put ourselves behind these bands, their sales would come back up because people wouldn't want to own the product, wouldn't they? And it's like when you're in a when you're in an older band like you and I'm playing in similar bands, our fan base still want to have the record, don't they? Of course you do, they and, and that goes right down back to young people. If young people discover these, I'm, I'm, students, I, when they discover Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, they start buying the vinyl. And do you know what I think half of it is? Whenever people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you can't beat the early stuff. <clears throat> can't beat the early stuff. You can't beat the early stuff. No, because listen to it. Sometimes the technology, even though it's great songs, there's something that's missing. Yes, the expression, the magic's been taken out. I want to hear that guitar slight feedback uh, because it's shit equipment or whatever it is. You know what I mean? You want to hear the little little blemishes and mistakes. Yeah. That made the whole rock and roll yeah. thing. Yeah. Clean it up. Uh, Andrew, you, you jump in now. Yeah, are you a musician or are you a, 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 a listener? I am. I am sorry, gents. I am a bassist, basically. Oh, my God. Above all I'll kick him out now, Russ. So, so, yeah, you can do. Sitting here with two drums. <laughs> but, I, you know, I mean, I do get what you're saying. I'm not a recording artist. Uh, kind of Andy knows that I've done a little project, um, which, you know, is sort of guilty of a lot of the things that you're kind of citing as a problem here. So, you know, you may, you may hate that kind of thing. I mean, I come from a very odd background and roots through music to end up where I am now. Um, but, you know, I think what you're talking about, that kind of skill level, I think it is, I and mean, it might be wrong, but, you know, I kind of cite the record companies as being kind of at fault, if you like, because, you know, and what you were talking about sort of earlier on was how... Um, everything's geared up from the producer's perspective. And the like focus now is purely on 
what are we going to put into whatever digital audio workstation we're using? Pro Tools, probably in a bigger studio, you know. But and that's like that's like a modern production approach, isn't it? But the sort of magic that you're on about was was and and you're talking a recording engineer as talented as the drummer playing the drums to get a quality recording from a room space, I think. I mean, I've had a bit of a go myself. I'm not experienced at all. Maybe there's some guys, but they might be rare things. So from the recording company's perspective, hiring a studio and hiring a quality engineer that knows what they're doing, that can deliver probably the most challenging thing to record is the drums in that environment. It's a huge expense for them. And on the other hand, you know, there's the, the the money from kind of record sales, well, it's just non-existent anymore, really, isn't it? The kind of industry and how it set itself up has just completely taken the bottom out of what's possible, you know. They're not going to invest in a studio and a top quality engineer for talking, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds to deliver no, actually, a record. What's, what's done that, you're right. But the answer is, that's what technology's done. Technology has got rid of the old way of recording. So, of course not, right? If yeah, you can do yeah. three takes and tidy it up with an engineer knows what he's doing in a couple of hours, it's far better than 35 takes over a three-week period. Yeah, of course it is. But that's where, as a, 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 I believe, you know, technology is great for what it is. But that's where it's, it's now gone full circle where it's ruining everything. And they don't care about the artist anymore. They don't care about the 35 takes to get the special one. That's the magic because it, it's irrelevant now. The playing is not as important as it was. That's why people don't book great players anymore. They, they book the players who are their mates because they want to go on tour with them. We all know that, but they just play, they, they, they book the players who are just good enough to do the, the gig they don't want to find the best players in the 60s and 70s they wanted the best players because that's what you did <laughs> russ you've, you've just said one of the big things that no one I, I don't think anyone's ever said this in public but i've thought this is at some point the big artists realize that they could walk down their local college or get their mate in on drums because in the end half of it is on playback right and they mm. could pay them less money right yeah that, and right. I and I know this when you ask you know when you look at big artists in the charts and you find out what they're paying their musicians because those musicians aren't as important anymore on stage because they're not really doing what a, the doing music used to do in the old days, right? And then you lose the personality. One of the things about you, Russ, is that you were amazing drummer, but you've got a, a big personality and you know how to beam that personality out from behind the drums. I've seen you play a million times. You know, mm. first time I saw you, you were doing a clinic. And the music started up, Michael Jackson. That's it, Earth he, Song. You yeah. walked in from the behind, from the back of the stage, <laughs> empty stage, drum kit. You walk in, you sit down like next to this bloke, and you turn around and goes, who's on then, mate? <laughs> Who's this? Is he any good? <laughs> and you milked it, that you know, and then you walked up and hit that just straight rock groove. And mm. the sheer weight of your personality, the big mm. personality, you beamed it out. And so many drummers have been told um that that's a skill you know you have to do big gigs you have to know how to push yeah push personality out and the, all these skills are getting forgotten i think they are getting forgotten and the thing is the powers to be are letting it go you see this is this is the problem they're letting it go and if the bigger powers or on the same level powers can't claw it back where does it go well it, it goes to where it's going now where it doesn't matter anymore it really doesn't matter anymore. You know, I've got the amount of times I've done recordings and the, the kit sounds fantastic. I've walked into the room. What's happened to the drums? What? It sounds like I'm hitting them. I said, they're massive in there. What, what the hell's going on? They don't want to turn the overheads up. Fucking hell. They don't want to turn the overheads up because I'd have to mix that. Well, oh, the thing is, it's like you put your heart, put your heart and soul in. I'm very, very emotional when I play, and I put all of my emotion into it. For someone just to take the emotional slider and put it down on zero, I might as well have just gone in there with no effort at all and just played it. Boom, gap, boom, gap. Thanks very much. You know, and it's like 
I didn't get taught to play like that. Do you realise what I've had to go through in my life to get to where I've got? And you're just going up yours, mate, up yours, mate. It's so uh, disheartening and disrespectful. Um, and it's the sad case of, you know, the art being lost, in my opinion, out of music. It's all about the, the melody line, right, with computerised backing tracks and um, someone looking pretty at the front. And that's it. That's really where music's going. And it doesn't matter if they're lost in a year's time because there's another... I mean, the old thousand... days, it was you and me looking pretty at the back. Well, there you go. <laughs> I do my best to look pretty. <laughs> you, look right. you, look, you look exactly the same as I saw you. Because <laughs> you've got a bald. If you've got a bald head, you don't age, do you? I've gone grey since well, last season. It is. It is. Um. It is a bonus. I do have to say. But I, yeah, I, I, my, my best mate John Jower, who, who he was in your eye heat for a couple. That's of right. Years. Yeah. He's another one. He's in his sixties now. He, he looks exactly the same because he's got the bald head. Uh, and as we get on to gigging, let's move on to that. Have you felt a change coming out of COVID and getting back out on tour? Do you feel like it, it's changed in any way? Well, it's the, the Brexit and COVID has changed everything. You know, um, I don't really want to get into the COVID thing because I've got my own personal views about it all. Uh, but... Yeah, I don't want my channel cancelled, Russ. No, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I um, you know, it, it's... it's Definitely, it put so many promoters out of work. Yeah, they all went bankrupt, and uh, venues went bankrupt, and everything. It annihilated everybody. Um, when we go out, the good thing was people were so good. Yeah, two and a half years, people were so hungry to see live music. It was like the first time they'd seen a live band. So the the magnetic emotion you had from artists and the the fans was fantastic. But yeah, it's, it's been tough um, as far as promoters going down. And then what with promoters 30 years ago used to pay the flights and pay hotels. There was enough money in the bin right, for everybody to get what they wanted. And promoters um, used to pay for it. Now the artists have to pay for it all. But the price still hasn't gone up. So, And the expenses have gone up. So all the expenses go up, the fee stays the same, and that's why some bands now can't even afford to uh, to fly to Europe or go to uh, America to do a tour because it just doesn't work out. You, you, you come back with 100 quid. You can't do that. And um, the other thing I found is, don't you think that bands are more willing to cancel a gig now or promoters are more willing to cancel a gig? I can't believe it. Before COVID, it was like you... You did the gig if your legs are falling off, didn't you? If you got the flu, you're ill, you did the gig. Mm. You know, and now, you know, bands will get up in the morning or the agent, it looks like it's raining, and they'll go, oh, it's raining, I don't think anyone's going to come, and they'll cancel the gig. It's, ha it's happened to yeah. me so many times. The whole thing is, is is it is in a state, and it's and it's good to be able to vent it all. Um, we, were, we did the 50th anniversary tour the back end of last year, and in the middle of the tour, two promoters went down, uh, we lost 14 shows and it cost us a fortune because we still had to pay the tour buses, yeah. the trucking, through the blah, 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 the blah, 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 the blah, blah, blah. It cost us a fortune because two promoters went under during our flaming tour. If you're watching this audience, if you're watching this, right, and you love this music, if you love Uriah Heep and you love all this classic rock and the prog and everything, if you're listening to this, support those bands as much as you can, because that's the only way it's going to survive. Um, I've right. yeah, known yeah. you for a while, Russ. I know how you play. When I heard you got the Uriah Heat gig, that's the perfect gig for you, isn't it? It's like yeah, it's made in heaven, isn't it? I mean, I really enjoyed the Alan Price and Chris Barber times. You know, I love playing. I I tend to play whatever style the same way. I'm a very energetic, and I. I can't stand anything that won't swing. I can't stand anything that hasn't got groove or energy or power, whatever it, it needs. But yeah, with that, the Heat gig, the good thing about, because of where they came from, 1970, um, I can actually be as simple and as busy as I like. I can actually be Russell Gilbert full on, whatever I want to play, and it gets accepted. I mean, it's such a rarity, isn't it? And, it, and when, when you joined, is that what they were like? It's like, we want you in the band. We want your personality. Do what you well, want. Well, there's two... There was two 
two way, there was 240 drummers that went for it. There was a lot of chances. They whittled it down to the last 40 over two weeks at what was Terminal Studios uh, at London Bridge. And um, I was, again, I, I tell all my uh, students when I used to teach at BIM, ACM and all that bit, I say, look, when an audition comes up, you've got to be prepared and you've got to be one step ahead. I said, because everyone can play. So why would they pick you? The ingredients have got to be there. First of all, yeah, you've got to have, as soon as you walk in, you've got to have an image. If you look like you've just come out of a bank or whatever it is, they may not want that. They might not want that. They might not want, so yeah, they might not want someone with a bald head. You don't know, right? But it's a rock band. I look pretty rocky, so I, w I was all right. That wasn't a problem. But I wangled my own kit, because I had a higher kit there, so I'll destroy that. I wangled my own kit on the last um, audition, which was five o'clock Friday. Right, and they had a, a gut full of it. I had to learn five songs that covered the perimeters of uh, the technicalities and stuff. They still had drummers going there trying to play Easy Living without the double shuffle. I mean, it's chalk and cheese the feel, and there's people going boot to that to do it to that, and not going that to that to that to that to that. Anyway, you got bad left hands, you see, so they couldn't do it. Well, well if, you, if they'd have said who could do a Texas shuffle to a room full of drummers, that's like that's like two thirds of them gone, isn't it? Two thirds of them gone, mate. I Two couldn't thirds believe. Of them Texas Shuffle. I had it when I joined Ian Parker's band, and he said you need to play Texas Shuffle. I did it. He said that's crap, Andy. And I went and bought a bloody Steve Ray Vaughan album, a BB King album. And I sat there, sat there for a week with my molar doing that. Getting it right, <laughs> yeah. Got it nailed. <laughs> yeah. But well, they these five five songs, and they had a nightmare over the two weeks. And I'm setting up my drum kit. I said, have you, you've learned the five songs, have you? I said, no. And their faces were like, oh, no. I said, I've learned the whole live set, because they sent me the set. I said, I've heard the whole, the whole live set, and I can do the gig tomorrow. And the whole place was, like, enlightened. And that's why you say, be prepared, over-prepare. I wanted to get, I knew I was going to get that audition. I either did a carbon copy, they either wanted a, a clone of Lee Curse Lake. It was the hell of a drummer, wasn't he? Hell of yeah. A or, or, or it's my time. And I said, no, I'm not going to be a clone of anybody. I'm going to be me. And that, luckily for me, they wanted something completely different. They didn't know what it was, right? That's so why I came in there. Mick went to count count the first song on Between Two Words. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm counting it in. I said, no, you're not. I said, I'm counting it in. And I felt everybody just relax as if, God, blimey, someone's taking charge at last. And um, so I learned the whole live set. I said I could play it. I counted them in. Obviously, the drum sounded great. They had more power than any other drummer. That they didn't. And that's, that was one of the criteria as well. When I've had people tell me, oh, you're hitting them drums hard, hitting the drums hard. I wouldn't have got that gig if I hadn't, hadn't have hit the drums hard. You learn they to hit the drums hard when you do big gigs. If you don't hit the drums hard on a big gig, you energy, look mate. like sooty on drums. Yeah, but yeah. they want to they want to feel the energy coming yeah, across. Yeah, they need to feel the energy. And the audience has got to feel that power. you're... you're beaming that sound out. We're into the last three minutes. Andrew, have you got a question for Russell? Um, yeah, well, I'll throw my lot in, if you like. How 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 are you finding, I know it's maybe may a bit personal, Russell, so how are you finding making a living from music? Are you still, are you managing to do it, or are you having to do, work in the pub on a Saturday and a Friday? <laughs> well, I love playing, so it doesn't bother me. I remember doing uh, 2019, we did Wacken, 80,000 people. It's the biggest uh, festival in um, Europe. And the following weekend, I was playing in front of a pub to 70 people. And I remember people saying, you at Wacken, why are you doing it? I said, I like playing. I'll choose when I want to play, when I want. It's not always about the money. So I've had ups and downs. I've lost two houses. I've been bankrupt. Um, and all because... As a musician, it's not about how good you are. The phone doesn't always just ring because you're available. It's like this bit. I've got a year off with Heat, which I'm not happy about with. Uh, but I got, they're not just going to sack drummers because old Russell's available. They don't matter how good I am. They don't just sack your drummer. And plus, also, it takes a while to circulate that I'm free. Oh, don't call Russie's with Heat. Don't call Russie's too expensive. Blah, 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 blah. No, I haven't said any of it. <laughs> so it has its ups and downs, and it's tough. I, I, the times yeah, I took it's really fantastic. but it's tough as a musician because you don't get regular work the only regular work you've got is if you joined ACDC or if you joined Iron Maiden right and, and they've been bands that have been going 40 50 years but they earn shit loads of money in the 70s so they've already got millions in the bank so it doesn't matter yeah <laughs> that's the thing Russell, we've got 
one minute to go, so we're all going to have to say goodbye. Did you enjoy that? Did you get all Fantastic. that vent up rage? Yeah, get it well, off your chest. That's the great. thing is, it's easy to talk about something that's reality, because I yeah. don't need to hide behind smoke screens. I'm out there doing it, I'm seeing it, I'm hearing it, and I'm just going on my own experience, you know. It's so easy to talk about your own experience. Russell, it's lovely to see you again, mate. And you, thanks for asking me. It's been a joy. Nice yeah, to meet you. I'll we'll keep in contact. And it's, Andrew, did you enjoy chatting yeah. to the legend that is Russ Talk Gilbrook? Chat. I'm glad I got my video work in this time. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> There's a new thing, Russ. I'm getting the patrons to jump into the interview so they can actually chat to musicians, see what we're like. Right. You know, yeah, the yeah, the, the trials awesome. and tribulations of it all. Good idea, um, mate. Yeah, it's good. That's what it's about. Got to reach that audience. But um, uh, we got like that, one minute to go, so I'm going to say goodbye. So would you no, like no. to say goodbye to all my uh, people watching this at the moment? So, so I do bye all of you, and uh, I hope you generous. enjoy this video. Like, subscribe, and uh, become a patron. Yeah. You could be chatting to Russell next time he comes on. That's right. Thanks for having me, Andy, and keep up the good work, mate. Well done, Lovely. Andrew. See you. Cheers,